So in terms of the protocol, um, uh, at, at our institution and most places that do prostate MR use a multi-parametric approach, and all that means is you are uh, looking at the prostate uh, not only for um, MR um, signal intensity signatures on T1 and T2, but you also add diffusion-weighted and dynamic contrast-enhanced MR. So it's a combination of all these sequences that provide you the the information. There are some institutions that do MR spectroscopy. We don't do it at our institution, so I will not be um, dwelling into spectroscopy. We rely more on dynamic contrast enhanced uh, MR than MRS because MRS, um, although a robust technique and has been extensively published, uh, is, is very technically intense and requires a, a dedicated team of um, physicists and others who problem solve the images. So it's, it's pretty involved. Therefore, we stick to uh, DC rather other than uh, MR spectroscopy. So this is sort of the uh, protocol we follow. We do a small field of UT1 weighted image where we are looking at the prostate gland. And the reason you want to do a T1 weighted sequence is because you're looking for hemorrhage. Uh, we, we typically like to image the patient six to eight weeks after the biopsy. And as you know, uh, prostate gland secretes um, um, prostatic fluid, one of the components of which is citrate. And citrate can function as an anticoagulant. Therefore, you have to wait a certain duration of time after the biopsy for the blood to have um, resolved. So the T1 weighting is basically you look for hemorrhage within the gland, and also it's a good anatomic sequence. When we do a T2-weighted wide field of view, um, uh, axial image that extends from the pubic symphysis to the aortic bifurcation. And the reason for doing this is, uh, as I said, it's not the goal is not only to be looking at the prostate, but also for regional lymph nodes and additional uh, findings. And this allows us to do that very well. Uh, we like to detect our lymph nodes on the sequences rather than on the uh, T1-weighted sequences. After the, um, the wide field of view, we do a narrow field of view um, T2-weighted axial, a narrow field of view T2-weighted sagittal, a narrow field of view uh, T2-weighted coronal. So this is sort of the multi-planar uh, T2-weighted uh, imaging of the uh, prostate, where the field of view is sort of narrowed down to the area of the prostate and the seminal vesicles. And then finally, once we do the, um, the conventional sequences, uh, the T2s, we follow it up with a diffusion-weighted sequence where we uh, perform the um, scans with um, the low and high B values. The higher B value we, we use is B of 1,000, and that generates the ADC map. And then finally, we do a dynamic um, um, acquisition uh, 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 while injecting gadolinium, and that's what allows us to de generate these uh, color maps, which are based on uh, certain thresholds, um, uh, preset thresholds, uh, and, and certain um, uh, enhancement uh, parameters, uh, quantitative parameters. And then the, the um, CAD cal sort of generates these uh, color maps that then allows us to look for areas of abnormal enhancement. So this is sort of the multi-parametric approach we take in terms of not only doing the conventional sequences, but also adding the diffusion and the, and the uh, contrast enhanced, dynamic contrast enhanced MR sequences. Uh, we get asked this question a lot in terms of uh, do we routinely use endorectal coil or not, and all our prostate MRs, unless there is a contraindication to do a uh, to placing an endorectal coil, we do place an endorectal coil. Um, and so the reason for doing it is one example I'm showing you here. This patient um, had uh, a MR without an endorectal coil, and as you can see, it's very difficult to appreciate the lateral boundary of the peripheral zone. And when you don't see that, it becomes very difficult to know if there is tumor extending beyond the uh, prosthetic capsule or not. The same patient with the endorectal coil, you can nicely see the uh, the outline of the uh, the peripheral uh, zone, and you can confidently comment on whether there is involvement of uh, extracapsular or there is extracapsular extension or not. So therefore, we we, we prefer to perform all of our MRs with uh, the endorectal coil uh, unless there is a contraindication uh, of of not placing the coil. Another important uh, factor about the endorectal coil is we use uh, air. Uh, there are some institutions that use perfluorocarbon, which is an excellent means. Uh, it is expensive, and that is one reason we have shied away from it. But uh, 
Um, certainly, if your institution has it and you can use it, it would be desirable to do that. Um, it is very important to follow the um, instructions of the volume of um, content that needs for that is required for adequate distension of the balloon. Because if inadequately distended balloon, as you're seeing here, typically eight, 80 cc's of air is required. But if you under distend it, you know, for instance, if the patient is feeling discomfort, you uh, you don't want to distend it all the way, then that's as good as not having the endorotal coil because, again, you don't see as well as when you completely distend and, you know, nicely, uh, oops, sorry, nicely um, um, distend the coil for, for better delineation of the margins of the prostate. Another important point to remember, it's very important for proper centering of the coil. Remember, the prostate coil is a received coil, and therefore it has to be very close uh, to the prostate. If it's superior uh, to the prostate, then it defeats the purpose of having the coil in there. So we typically, uh, once we place the coil, we will uh, we quickly do a sagittal um, a single shot or, or a, a haste sequence, which is very fast, just to make sure the coil is in optimal position, uh, because that is very critical for getting good signal from the uh, from the gland. Another sort of trick uh, that is very useful is, um, unlike the routine pelvic imaging, which is non-prostate pelvic imaging, where typically phase is in the anterior-posterior direction and frequency is on right to left, we swap the phase and frequency to the phase is in the right to left direction. And the reason that is important, as you can see here, the coil does wobble a little bit occasionally, depending on you know peristalsis of the rectum or, uh, or, or inherent motion of the coil itself. And here you can see that that motion is being proper in the right to left direction. Imagine if it was in A to P, it would get propagated. That would sort of, again, um, result in uh, compromised image quality. So this is uh, important to do if um, you want to get good quality images. Another important point I'd like to emphasize is there are institutions that use anti-peristaltic uh, agents. Uh, we typically don't do, um, or don't administer that because our scans are done unmonitored. Um, uh, in other words, you know, the, the fellows or the attendings place the coil and then the rest of the remainder of the exam is, is sort of carried over, carried, are done by the technologist. So uh, the cost and the added time um, is, is an issue with us, so we don't, but there are institutions that do it and if you can, I think that does help in getting rid of some of the motion that you may get from peristalsis.